Hello, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Let me know if you can hear me okay, if you can see me okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Uh, this is the live office hours for the School of Sweet Georgia. My name is Felicia, and I'm the founder and creative director for Sweet Georgia and also the School of Sweet Georgia here. So if this is your first time joining our live office hours, welcome. We've been actually running these monthly live stream sessions for almost four years now, which just seems so incredibly crazy for me. Um, we do this every uh, month on the last Thursday of each month. And so the link to join the live stream and the chat is actually only available to members of the school. So if you're watching this video after the live stream date and you wish that you had been there in the chat room and then you wish that you could have asked a question, I really welcome you to join us as a member of the school. So you can find out that information all the time, anytime, schoolofsweetgeorgia.com slash join. So once you are an all access member, you'll get notified with a link to join the live stream, which is here. It's unlisted on YouTube. And thank you guys so much for joining this morning. I see so many familiar faces and names in the chat right now. This is fantastic. Um, wonderful. Thank you guys so much for being here. So if you have any questions today, you are more than welcome to pop them in the chat and ask me um, because, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, we have lots and lots of um, things to talk about today, but I would love to see your questions as well. And um, don't worry if you can't stay for the entire thing, because uh, if 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 you miss any part of it, all of this is recorded and it's going to be available in the school later on in the library. So you can catch it, catch the replay anytime. So let's get to what we're going to be talking about. Hi, Robin. Hi, Rihanna, Glenda, Andrew, Arlene. Oh my gosh, there's so many. Pearl, Marjorie. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you for being here. So I'm trying to get to my slide. There we go. Okay. Fantastic. Sometimes we have problems with the camera cutting out. And so if that happens, <laughs> I will turn myself off and then go back and turn myself back on. But this is what we are going to be uh, very uh, quickly talking about today. So, so, so I'm going to try and follow along with the chat as I go through all of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. But we are going to be talking about new content that's coming into the school. We always talk about new content. I'm going to be talking about the community events and some changes that we've had recently and also talking about some upcoming zoom workshops which are going to be um, uh, a new thing a relatively new thing um, and also a little bit of questions and answers and showing you a little bit of my progress what we've been working on and also sharing some of the work of the members in the school so thank you guys for being here for this so the first thing I want to share with you is that actually Greta just joined the chat as well, but Greta and I and David, we were filming yesterday. We're filming with an instructor. Her name is Sam Jalber. She's from Steveston and Richmond area, and her um, her company name is called Kusin and Kiss, which is very, very sweet, but she came to teach Punch Needle this week with us. And uh, so you can see those are two of the samplers. These are like a sneak preview of the things that she's going to be teaching, but we filmed yesterday with her, and uh, we are filming tomorrow again with her, but but uh, we have been really quite um, excited about the whole punch needle side of things. I, I, she, Sam gave me her um, her hoop to go home and uh, practice with, and so she lent that to me. So you can see this is my practice, my little sampler. It's not anything to write home about, but I was really inspired by the techniques that she was showing. So just taking the little Amy Oxford punch needle and practicing some of the different stitches. So I have some flat stitches, some loop stitches. So all of this is being filmed right now. And there's going to be two projects in this course and some kits and things like that. We've been dyeing some different yarns so that we can try working with different yarns for this kind of technique. And this course should be available in June. So not too, not too long from now. I'm going to put this down. So that is the first thing that is coming. Um, the next thing is that the sheep breeds, the spinning sheep breeds course, the big massive epic course. This has actually uh, just been released. The first module has been released. So if you're in the school, you can go and uh, watch Rachel talk about spinning fine and medium wools. This is generally the kinds of wools that we think of when we're thinking about spinning. But then 
Rachel will move from fine and medium wools and then move into long wools. She'll move into down wools and she'll also move into these uh, wools called double coated and primitive wools. And so we have actually uh, put together a bunch of kits to help you with a sheep breed study. So if you're wanting to spin a lot of these different sheep breeds and you don't know really where to access this fiber, we have collected together 12 different kinds of fiber. And so I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Actually, I can kind of show you. I can show you what we've put together for these. But um, yeah, so we put together some of these kits. You can see here we have a tube of fiber here. And each of these tubes of fiber has three different kinds of sheep in it. So this one has Gotland, Kent, Robney, and Wensleydale. This is the long wool. Um, each one of these chunks of fiber looks like this sort of thing. So it's two ounces of fiber. It's been braided. It's undyed fiber so that you can feel what the wool feels like to begin with, like just um, just with nothing, no no changes to it because through the dyeing process. So it's just nice and combed and beautiful. So that's one of the kits. Here's uh, the fine and medium wool kit. And this has got some Finnish wool in it, the fin, uh, merino and rambouillet. And here, the down one is Charolais, Cheviot, and Suffolk. So those three. And the last kit is the Primitive Double Wool. Uh, and that has Icelandic, Jacob, and Shetland. So that's kind of what it looks like here. So this is, this is the white Jacob fiber. And I think this is the, this is the Icelandic. So a whole bunch of different uh, kinds of wools for you to play with and feel, and they all feel a little bit different. They're all going to spin a little bit different. And Rachel goes into great detail about each one of these things in that class. So I hope that you guys enjoy that. So yeah, Greta has been spinning all of these fibers and um, she's been showing them on her Instagram. And uh, it's, it's really, really quite lovely. Uh, she showed me in real life. I got to I got to touch and feel her yarn. It was really really lovely. Um, and because they come in these natural colors, we wanted to like provide different colors for everybody to spin with, so that they could see like what does a natural gray spin like, what does a natural brown spin like, and so all of these things because they have slight um, underlying natural colors, you could mix and combine them into a color work project at the end of the day. Yeah, fantastic. The next class that I want to tell you guys about is the natural dyeing class that we finished uh, filming with Caitlin. And this one launched, I believe, on the class yesterday. So if you have not been to the school since yesterday, <laughs> you'll see when you go log in that uh, Caitlin's class is now up. And so this one is on natural dyeing. This is one that we have wanted to make for a long time now, but just because of, you know, um, pandemic stuff last year that we had to uh, uh, delay any filming and all of this kind of stuff. So this year, we're very, very excited to finally be able to offer this natural dyeing class. So Caitlin, she is a local uh, natural dyer. She's been dyeing for something like 15 years with natural dyes. And uh, so she comes to the studio and works with some of the natural dyes that we have here through Botanical Colors. So that's uh, a color company in Seattle and they they curate and collect tons and tons of natural dyes uh, natural dyes from all over and uh, we're working with a number of different colors so black maybe logwood matter weld uh, using a whole bunch of different natural dyes showing you how to mordant different kinds of fibers so mordanting cotton how mordanting cotton is different from wool from different from silk all of these kinds of things and um the reason why i really wanted to bring caitlin in to teach this natural dye class is uh not just because of her experience with working with natural dyes and you know cooking them up in the pot and everything but she has um a very uh strong uh perspective on this idea of wild crafting and the practice of wild crafting which is to go out into your environment and to pick plants from your environment for use in your own natural dye practice. And so she has very good guidelines about how to do that in a way that is still going to protect your environment, that's not going to damage um, or, or yeah, just damage the, 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 the land base that you're working from. And so um, I really, really encourage you guys to check out her classes. All the courses are available now um, so that you can you can have a look. If you've ever wanted to do any natural dyeing, this is a great time to do it. 
And I have more to talk about with natural dyeing in just a minute. But the next thing I want to talk about is the calendar for next uh, month. So this is our community calendar, which you can access through community and then go to calendar. <laughs> and um, for May, we have this Saturday, May 1st at 12 p.m. PST. Vicky, she's one of our SOS moderators. She's going to be hosting the spring make along meetup. So you can bring your project, you can bring your work in progress. Um, if you're doing the make along, you can come join, see what everybody is doing. Um, and that'll be a Zoom meeting. So you can find the link for the Zoom meeting through the calendar. Um, also, every other Tuesday now, we've we've increased the frequency. So every other Tuesday, Robin will be hosting a sort of a knit meetup on Zoom. And so Robin is here in the chat. I saw her earlier as well. And um, so yes, she is hosting uh, that meetup. And then Charlotte, she hosts the Thursday meetup. So that's Thursday every other, th well, it's the, it's the second and fourth Thursday of every month. And that is in the evening Pacific Standard Time. So hopefully there's a number of different um, time zones, you know, offerings and things like that so that you can join no matter what time zone you're in. Uh, Vicky also hosts a spinning and weaving one on the third Saturday of every month. And so that is happening as well. And um, yeah, if you still wanted to join our make along, it's still happening until May 11th. I actually am working on my make along project. It's a lace project. <laughs> I'll just show you a very, very quick snippet of it. But this is my sweater that I've been working on. And you can see like the lace yoke here. Maybe I'll, I'll switch to this. So you can see this is this is my sweater. It's coming along. This is the Laya pullover. And uh, it's made out of the flax and silk fine. You can see the yoke, the lace part is all done. One of the things that I uh, did not realize when I was reading the pattern until after I started actually knitting it, this is not, um, it's not lace knitting. It's knitted lace, I think is the thing. So there's no resting roll, rows. So basically every single round has yarn overs and decreases on it. There's no, there's no cleanup resting round with this particular lace. And then um, Greta's saying, I'm almost done. <laughs> I'm not almost done. I still have like 10 inches of stockinette in the rounds to knit. So this is coming along. But once I finish the body with all the stockinette, then I can just cast off the sleeves and I will have a summer sweater, a summer sweater <laughs> to wear. So that is what's happening there with my make along project. I have not posted a photo in the forums yet with this because we've just been quite busy. Lots of stuff going on right now. So that is that. Um, I also wanted to highlight for you that in this calendar section here, um, let's switch back to this one. You can see here that we have the community calendar, which is like those community Zoom events that are happening. But I also created two more categories, and one of them is Zoom workshops, because we're having several of those this summer, and also study groups. And so we're going to talk about that as well. So we are having three Zoom workshops with our instructors, the first one being with Caitlin. And so this is basically coming about a month after her natural class her natural dye class has launched. So dye class launched yesterday. And then in a couple of weeks, we're doing a Q&A session with Caitlin. So basically the idea is that if you watch the class, if you have any questions about any of the stuff that she's talked about, you can come and join her and um, ask your questions live, kind of like a live office hours like this. But hopefully um, you can come and ask her in a more uh, like a Zoom meeting so that way we can all be there in the same room at the same time. And just very casual, you know, uh, casual feedback, anything that you would like to ask Caitlin, we can do at that time. So May 26th, at 12 p.m. PST on Zoom. And then we have two upcoming workshops with Kathy Hattori from Botanical Colors. So again, like I said, Botanical Colors, they supply natural dyes. Um, they're based in Seattle. I met Kathy years and years and years ago, I think like in 2008 or something like that, um, when she was working <clears throat> at another dye supplier in Seattle at Earth Hughes. And um, since then, Kathy's grown botanical colors into this wonderful, wonderful thing. And so she's gonna come and teach hand painting with natural dyes on June 23rd on Zoom and also indigo dyeing. She's gonna show us how to prepare an indigo dye uh, vat from scratch using one of the really, really simple methods that, that does not include any lye. So it's going to be an organic fructose 
indigo vet. And so she's gonna show how to do that on Zoom. And so that's gonna happen on July 21st at 12 p.m., also PST on Zoom. And so for all of those, um, all of those links, I want you guys to go to the calendar and then get the event, find the event, and then use the registration link in there to register because that's how you will get the the, the URL to join the Zoom group. So you'll, you'll need that URL in order to join the Zoom meeting. So please do go and sign up. And then that way it helps us prepare for how many people are going to be coming because there's a limited number of seats in a Zoom room as well for a Zoom meeting. So we just want to know how many people are coming um, and uh, how we should best prepare for that. So I'm looking forward to that. Really, really looking forward to this. Uh, one of these days when things are more open, I would love to actually go down to Botanical Color so um, we can film a little bit and, and you can meet Kathy more in person <laughs> through video. And that, I think that that would be super wonderful. So the next thing that I want to talk to you guys about when it comes to natural dyeing is that this summer we would like to do a natural dye study group. So this is something that we have been talking about for some time now. We wanted to lead um, study groups uh, to help people go through a lot of the content in the school. Now that we're getting to the point where there's actually quite a lot of courses in the school, um, sometimes we get questions about, well, where do we start? Which class do we start with? How do we go through this? And um, so I know that when I posted the initial dyeing classes, the acid dyeing classes way, 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 way back at the beginning, um, people would watch the videos, but sometimes it would take, um, you know, a lot of time to gain the um, courage to jump in and actually start dying like it's one thing to collect all the equipment and you get all the supplies and you know you're going to do it and you know you're going to do it but then I think it could be very encouraging to actually do it together with other people and be really motivated you know everybody dying their dying triangles at the same time everybody you know mordanting their yarn at the same time something like that so we're wanting to try doing this as um uh, a bit of an experiment. So this first study group we want to do in the summertime and it's going to focus on natural dyeing. I mean, maybe next summer if we do another uh, dyeing study group, maybe it could be about fiber reactive dyes, maybe it could be about acid dyes. Um, so there's, there's that idea of doing things seasonally when it makes sense to do that craft. So um, summer is when we're going to do this natural dyeing study group and we're going to start on June the 1st and it will run for about 10 weeks. And so during the course of all of this, uh, every week we're going to be sort of breaking down uh, what we're going to be focusing on. So I have here kind of written out basically during week one, we'll focus on getting supplies and materials, looking at your space, looking at safety. Week two, we'll talk about like the differences between acid dyes, fiber reactive dyes, natural dyes. This is not like new lessons every week. Basically what we'll do is we'll kind of direct you to the content that has already been made by Caitlin or by myself or by Mariana and um, just sort of directing you to which, what chunk of content can we digest this week together. And then the week of June 15th, we'll do some mordanting together. So you can choose whatever kind of fiber you want to uh, work with. And then each week we'll dye some different colors. So my idea is to mordant a big batch of yarn that, so that you have everything ready and available. And then every week you can just basically prepare a new dye bath and then we'll just pop some of those mordanted skeins in and then you get color every week. And during that time, there's also going to be um, Kathy's Zoom classes with the hand painting is going to come up. There's going to be um, another live office hours. There'll be the indigo dyeing workshop. And then near the end, end of July, there's going to be one week where we can make an indigo vat together. So you can uh, participate and actually do it along with us. Or you can just, you know, uh, work through the content with us. But the whole idea is that we do it together week by week so that it's a little bit more digestible and easy to do. Um, during this time, we are going to be, I'm hoping that I'm going to be dyeing enough yarn to weave a blanket later on in the fall and in the winter time. And so what we were thinking with these study groups is that with the natural dyeing study group happening in the summertime, maybe in the fall, we'll focus on spinning and we'll do a spinning study group in the fall. And we'll focus on one particular aspect of spinning. So it's not just like spinning, but um, 
something that we're going to really, really focus on. And then in the winter time, we'll focus on one aspect of weaving. And I have an idea of what I'd like to do, but I want to use that yarn that we dye during the natural dye class, during the natural dye study group, and use that for what we'll weave in the weaving study group. So this is all kind of like flowing together, step by step. This is kind of like the things that we always talk about, right? Like the continuous evolution of craft from one season to the next season to the next season. So thank you, Robin, saying I'm so excited for this course, trying to plan a weaving project for the fall to pick colors. Yeah, so it's kind of like thinking about what are you going to dye in the summertime so that you can have stuff to either spin or weave in the fall and winter time. So kind of gradually along that idea. And Tamara's asking if there's any extra cost for any of this stuff. The study group, it's all included in your membership fee. The um, workshops, the two Zoom workshops with Kathy Hattori and the one with Caitlin on Zoom, all of those are also included in your all access membership fee. So there's no additional cost to any of those things. Basically, we just want everybody to register so that we know how many people are coming so we can sort of prepare for that, even just mentally prepare for that. <laughs> So if you guys want to participate in um, a study group like that, we already have the um, we already have the group in the community set up so that you can go and join that. There's a little bit of chatter in there as well. Um, so you can find the link for that down here as well. Yeah, in the spring, we do knitting in the spring. Spring is always for knitting. I also wanted to highlight just a few other things that I have changed on the website. So. Um, I took a little bit of time to refresh uh, the instructor area of the site so that you can go and check out who the instructors are and learn a little bit more about each instructor. Since we have so many new instructors joining the school this year, I wanted to find a really good way to sort of feature them for you so that you know uh, what they're all about, you know what their personal work is, you know, you know, all of these kinds of things. So um, if you go to the instructors page, it's under the about tab, you'll see all the instructors and then you can click through and then learn more about their bio. And also they have portfolios for each one of the instructors now and places where you can follow them on Instagram or Facebook, see their website, see their Etsy shops, whatever they have. Um, yeah, just another way for you to get to know these instructors a little bit better. And just a reminder to let you know that if you have any questions about any of their courses, you can always pop into the forums and tag them because they are there, they're there and they're answering questions. They're answering questions quite extensively and being extremely helpful. So if you ever need help with anything, like Jan has been answering a ton of tapestry questions. So you'll find a lot of help over there. The other thing I wanted to share with you is that uh, I made a content roadmap page. So basically, uh, again, under the About tab, there's a new thing that says Content Roadmap. But this basically shows you all the content that is coming. I know I talk about it every time we have one of these live office hours, but it's also another way for you to see like all the stuff that we have planned for the rest of the year because um, there's only so many things that I can talk about in this time. And uh, so right now, you know, Tabitha is working on a triangle shawl. We're filming Punch Needle right now. All of these other things are coming. Uh, yeah, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be filming with Diana Twist again, and we're doing croak rag weaving later on this summer. So all of these things are coming. So if you've ever been curious about like what's coming up, you know, later this fall, what's coming up uh, later this year, you can check out this page to see what is going to happen. And finally, this is another thing that I have been uh, working on very gradually. But again, like I mentioned at the beginning, people come to the school and because there's so many courses now, like if you go to the spinning page, there'll be like nine different spinning classes and you're going to look and think, I don't know where to start. I don't know which class to start with, which if I want to learn how to spin, where do I start? And so I started to put together this learning path idea. So leading you from the very beginning and showing you sort of stepwise which class you need to take in which order in order to get you to the place that you want to be. So if you're like just coming to spinning from absolutely knowing nothing, then you'll want to start with the spinning from scratch course. And then after that, where should you go? And after that, where should you go? And all of this kind of stuff in order to progress through your own growth and development. So I'm going to be working on this for all of the different craft uh, categories. But right now I've just done the spinning one. So you can kind of see there's a start to spin, 
you do the spinning from scratch course and then I suggest you go to Diana Twiss's class about spinning with suspended spindles and then after that you can go to Katrina's class the spinning up a level and then Rachel has two classes spin to knit a sweater spin to knit socks and uh and so on and so on and so there's a third category about twisting with tools spinning with different tools so that would be like spinning with e-spinners spinning with supported spindles spinning with suspended spindles spinning with eventually there's going to be other classes maybe we'll look at spinning with a charka spinning cotton spinning silk all of these kinds of things and so we're going to build it into this pathway so i am always open to ideas if you guys have any ideas about what we should be doing or how we can change things i'm totally open to ideas and suggestions but yeah, that's what we're building right now. So now let's get into a few of the questions. Now, to be honest, there were not very many questions at all this past month, like at all, because um, I think what's been happening is that people have been sharing more of the stuff that they've been making in the forums. And um, many of the teachers have been answering a lot of the questions. So the questions are pretty much all answered. But I did want to share with you a couple of things um, that have been happening inside the forums. And that, so that is uh, last month, we talked about the blending board course and the blending board content that had come out. We've made some Rolex, you know, talking about how to make Rolex, how to spin Rolex. And so people were showing a lot of things here. So um, for the blending boards, uh, Elena was saying how to make it easier to roll off the roll the roll lags off the board last one got me throw three roll lags and the final part came off like a mini bat no matter what i do i've been finding it nearly impossible to get my board not to slide or tip around as i'm trying to get the roll lags feels like i need to have three or four hands rather than the two that we are all born with and so i did have that exact same situation as well i'm using the same um, ashford blending board and i was able to roll off three roll eggs at the same time um, yeah three roll eggs for one thing um, and I feel like my roll eggs were way too thick for what I was doing and so I think the reason why it's so hard to pull those roll eggs off when you're only doing three um, is because there's too much fiber in there and so I watched Debbie's uh, classes again and watch how she used her thumb to push to hold the dowels and then push off of the blending board and you're pushing up pulling up a little bit so that you're um, pulling the fiber away from the rest of the blending board in order to loosen it so that you can break it off so that has been one of the things that i've had to work on too because i told charlotte too i said i'm having trouble you know pulling the roll eggs off i feel like i'm pulling the cloth off of the blending board and she's like i'm not having that problem <laughs> So I think it was like the way that I positioned my hands. And so uh, I think very much like you have to push, not um, not take too much fiber because it's just like drafting, right? You're trying to pull all this fiber. It's going to be very difficult to pull all the fiber off in one chunk. So it's kind of like you have to wiggle a little bit, pull up a little bit, wiggle a little bit, that sort of thing. So I'm going to be working on that, breaking up my bat into many, many, many more roll lags. So that's one. Uh, Wendy also had a tip here. She says, I know that many people find it difficult to tension the dowels. So I've attached a pick of my dowels my hubby made for me. Can you see that they're tapered from one uh, thick end at one end to thin at the other? And that makes it easier to pull out. Yes. So there were um, a couple of suggestions. So when Debbie made, Debbie held when she made her course, she talked about how to position the dowels so that your dowels are not, um, not together. They're not like end to end together, but they're offset from each other. So rather than having them exactly like, I don't have two pencils, <laughs> and not having them exactly um, match, like not their ends match at the same end, um, but having them offset from each other. And then that allows you to pull one dowel out a little bit quicker than the other. And so here, Wendy is saying that if you taper one of the dowel or taper each of the dowels, so they're, like, they're kind of like chopsticks. You have a thick end and a thin end, and you place the thick end of one dowel to the thin end of the other dowel. That gives a little bit of a uh, gap, which allows you to separate the dowels a little bit easier and pull them out so that your roll lag doesn't get damaged in the process. So yeah, so a couple of blending board tips. I hope that you guys have been enjoying that class. Um, it is super fun to do. I have been spinning um, the Rolag, spinning carded preps, and um, I will have more of that kind of stuff to show. I made a, like a little bit of a spinning Rolag video for YouTube, which will be coming out at some point in time. 
Um, I had this other question that I wanted to share with you guys, and that was the question of whether or not um, fiber reactive dye was tricky. So um, Jamie was asking about, do you use acid dyes or fiber reactive dyes? I've been super curious about fiber reactive dyes so that I can work with fibers like Tencel, bamboo, and mercerized cotton, but I wasn't sure if it's trickier than acid dyes. And so this came out of a topic that was unrelated to dyeing altogether. It was related to the knitting and hand dyed color class that just came out as well. Um, but yeah, we have these three different categories of dyeing classes on the school uh, because they are designed to work with different kinds of fiber. So acid dyes are designed to work with wool and silk and protein fibers, so things that came from animal sources. And then fiber reactive dyes are designed to, used, uh, to be used with cellulose fibers. So cotton, bamboo, hemp, um, tencel, all of those fibers, linen, uh, that would all be dyed by fiber reactive dyes. And so fiber reactive dyes, uh, if you've never heard of them, if you're not familiar with them, they are basically the dyes that people use for tie dye. So a cotton t-shirt, you tie it up and then you dunk it in this fiber reactive dye. Brilliant, bright, stunning, vibrant colors come out of this process. Um, it is a lot easier than you think it is. And so this photo here is basically strips of cotton fiber, cotton fabric that I just basically cut up. They're just into like one inch strips. And um, I have a whole bunch of jam jars, which have been designated as dye jam jars. And uh, basically in each one of those little jars, I have a little bit of dye, like a dye stock solution that I've measured out um, and a little bit of soda ash. And uh, yeah, pop that fiber in and it is ready to go. Uh, it's a lot easier than you think it is because you don't have to worry about heating it up. So the way that fiber reactive dyeing works is that over time, the process happens almost at um, room temperature. In, in the summer, again, it's a great thing to do in the summer because I basically put all the dyes together, cover it with some saran wrap or even cover it with a black uh, garbage bag, and then just leave it in the sun. And that is enough heat to let it batch to let it set. Um, yeah, Tamara is saying I've not used fiber reactive dyes yet, but I have them from Dharma Trading Company, so it'll be very interesting. Yeah, it's actually very, very easy. I know that with acid dyeing, the big hurdle is trying to figure out where am I going to cook the yarn? Am I going to cook it in a pot? Do I need a stove? Do I put it in a microwave? How do I steam it? Do I get a steam pan? Do I get a steam kitchen like chafing dish thing? Um, there's just a lot of anxiety around how am I going to cook and heat and set the dyes in the yarn. Um, fiber reactor dyes has none of those challenges. Um, I think that if you would like to learn more about fiber reactor dyeing, you can also check out um, the class that Mariana Frochtengarten made for us called Shibori Dyeing Basics. And so uh, Mariana, she dyes fabric. She folds up the fabric and she does a bunch of shibori techniques with the fabric, but it's basically cotton fabric that's been folded up and then dunked into fiber reactive dye. And when she came to film with me a couple summers ago, all of her stuff, all of her dye stuff basically fit into one Rubbermaid bin. And she could do all the dyeing in that bin. Like literally everything is very compact, very easy to do. Um, you don't need a ton of equipment. You don't need a ton of space. You don't need a designated dye kitchen. It's, it's much easier, I think, in a lot of ways to use fiber reactive dyes. The one thing that um, is a bit of a mental hang up for me is that when the dye process is done, there's still color in the water. The water looks like it has color in it. And so for that reason, um, it, I always feel like, well, I don't know if it's completely finished batching. So I let things go for a long, long time. I batch things for, you know, 24 hours or more because I'm not sure that it's totally done. Um, but that's just me. When I talk to Mariana, she's like, no, you only need like an hour or two. <laughs> so um, it's just me coming from sort of an acid dyeing background where I think that everything should be exhausted and the dye bath should be clear and seeing color in the water with the fiber reactor dyeing process. I'm a little bit like, oh, I don't know about that. But it is it is very easy to do. So I encourage you to give that a try this summer if, if you wanted to try. Oops. There we go. Okay. So um, another question that I got through email was, uh, Jenny was asking, I'm a long time knitter, but I've been thinking about trying spinning. Of course, I need a spinning wheel. I have narrowed my search to several good options for a beginner, but 
Is there any good reason why I shouldn't just jump straight to an e-spinner like an Ashford 3? I like the size, tabletop aspect, and portability. Is there a reason I should really start on a treadle instead? With prices being similar to treadles, I'm considering just wondering. And so Greta is saying, I'm test driving the EW and it's an amazing e-spinner at a very affordable price. I'm quite impressed. I don't have any previous experience with other e-spinners, but I do love it so far. So yes, Greta and I, we are using the same EEW6. Um, Dreaming Robots was very kind to send us a copy of this uh, beautiful brand new e-spinner for us to test drive and, and make like some reviews about and things. So um, I made an unboxing video that is gonna go live tomorrow morning. And uh, thank you to Leah for editing that beast <laughs> of a video. It was just content, random content of me pulling things out of the box and trying to assemble it. But um, here is the bobbin that I have so far spun with that new EEW. So it's an e-spinner. It, uh, it was created through a uh, Kickstarter project that he did last year. And uh, so like a couple years ago, I made videos about the Nano, which is like a tiny, tiny e-spinner. It's almost like a prototype of this larger e-spinner. So this larger one, after using it, I just find that it is so solid, so robust. It spins beautiful, beautiful yarn. Um, it's smooth, consistent, even it has been fantastic. And so um, I am going to be doing like a much more comprehensive review looking at the EEW Nano with the EEW 6 with the Ashford eSpinner, just kind of like doing a side by side comparison so people can see, you know, what do they sound like? What's the difference in sound? What's the difference in size? All of that kind of stuff. But I, I think that um, the question about whether or not you should start on a treadle, um, I think I don't know that it's absolutely necessary. I think that when you do start on a treadle wheel, it is nice because you learn how to manage your feet and you learn how to treadle and start your wheel and stop your wheel without touching it with your hands, all of this kind of stuff. I feel like that whole body experience is um, it's very valuable to have, um, but it's not the only way that you can learn how to spin. I know that um, many people start spinning with a spindle or a drop spindle and then talking to Debbie Held and some people say that it's actually easier to start spinning with the supported spindle because you can do park and draft very, very easily. The park and draft technique is already kind of inherent in when you're spinning with a supported spindle. So mainly the most important thing about learning how to spin from the very, very beginning is learning how to draft fiber and learning sort of how close or how far to hold your hands as you're spinning your fiber. I feel like that is the most important part of learning how to spin. All of these other tools are just designed to add twist, whether it's adding twist with your feet or adding twist by flicking your spindle or adding twist by pushing the button on the e-spinner. All of these things are just designed to add twist for you. And so then you have to manage how quickly that twist is generated. Um, and so you can dial your e-spinner all the way down so that it's very slow, so that it can keep up with your drafting hands as you're starting. But I think that the most important thing is learning how to draft. Learning how to draft. I'm trying to follow along with the chat as well. <laughs> And Rihanna saying, I just got the Spin Illusion Firefly e-spinner, but I have to work out how to set up the drive bands. Um, Janice started with a Nano and progressed to the Ashford. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Yeah, Tamara saying she prefers a wheel to the e-spinner. Yeah, you know, I go back and forth between all of these tools. You know, I have a matchless that I spin on occasionally. I have the Landrum Saxony, which I love spinning on. It's just just spins so beautifully and um, rotating between the different devices, I feel like also forces your body to adjust to each one of these devices and um, gain that flexibility, that versatility, that ability to bounce from tool to tool. Are the e-spinners better for making finer yarns for beginners? I'm working uh, with a Turkish spindle at the moment. I don't think that e-spinners are necessarily better for making finer yarns. You can absolutely make beautiful, fine, consistent yarns on an e-spinner. Um, again, I think it all comes down to draft and twist, draft and twist, and then learning the relationship between, you know, how much fiber to draft out to make a fine yarn, how much twist to add to that fiber, all of that stuff. Um, so it's kind of like this dance, you know, moving between all of these different variables and aspects. 
Yeah, ace spinners are fantastic. It's just, it was something that was not accessible when I first started spinning. And now it's just fantastic. It's like this e-spinner that's the EEW is only $279 US, which it just, it boggles the mind. <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about progress log. I encourage you guys last time to go back and work on your progress logs, to write about your learning plans. Just make notes about things that you're learning and working on. And um, so I wanted to share some of the projects that I've been working on as well. And so this is uh, basically I set up a bunch of twill gamps um, on my loom at home. And I initially had set them at 15 ends per inch and then I worked on them at 14 ends per inch. And I want you guys to look at a couple of different things things that I have here to show you. So let's see if I can switch to this. Ah, there you go. You can see my twill gamps. So this is just like a little sample that got cut off. I surged the ends so that nothing is falling apart. It's a nice way to save your weaving samples. And this is the end of one. So this is the first one that I made. And so you can't really see the whole edge to edge, edge to edge. This one is the one that was set at 15 ends per inch. And I thought that when it was on the loom, it felt like it was a little bit tight. It was a little bit hard to beat. I felt like it didn't always like pack down. So you can see like the diamond shapes don't seem like squares. They seem a little bit elongated in this case. Yeah, I'm still trying to work through that. And I can still see like where I've made threading mistakes in this whole thing. And so that's why I wanted to weave this entire thing again. And so, yeah, this has been washed. And when it was on the loom, I felt like I was like going blind trying to see where my mistakes were and everything like that. And so I'm going to try and show you here um, on this one. This is the one that theoretically should be correct. I checked and double checked and triple checked all of the threading. So everything on this twill gamp should be threaded correctly. Um, but you can see, I'm sure that you can see the unevenness, like you can see how things don't look super even. Um, yeah, you can see like there's a bit more blue on this side. It, things don't look like they're spaced properly. And then the reason for this is because um, when you're working with a set of 14 and you have either a 12 dent read or a 10 dent read, there's no easy way to convert 14 ends per inch into a 10 ends per inch read. You're going to have some slots of the read where two are going to be coming through, two warp ends are going to be coming through, and some where there might only be one and some. And so it's all a little bit mixed up. So you can see it more clearly on this section here, because this is, I wove the end of the warp with a little bit of, um, with a little bit of uh, plain weave. So you can see here, you can see how the, the warps look a little bit crammed together. Um, some sections have more white. It looks like it's just more dense in that area, even though it should be 100% just plain weave. And so these are basically reed marks that are left by that uneven slaying of the reed. Like if you're going to do something that's 12 ends per inch, you can do one in each slot. Um, of a 12 dent read. If you're doing 15 ends per inch with a 10 dent read, then you do one end and then two ends and then one end and then two ends. And so you're going to get a little bit of that clumping happening. And so that clumping is happening here. But uh, the clumping was also happening in the first twill gamp that I made. But after I washed it, all of that unevenness disappears. It should theoretically just all disappear. And so um, yeah, Rihanna is suggesting that maybe I should get a different lamp. I should. I should get a proper, some proper lighting for that, um, for that area. But yeah, Greta said asking, it would the textile even out after blocking? And yeah, it does. So if I go and I wash this, I'll take photos before and after, but after I wash this, it should theoretically all even out and look much more, um, much more homogeneous is the word for that. Uh, it'll look much more even at the end of it. But while you're working on it, it is quite hard on your eyes trying to figure out like, did I make a mistake here? Does this look even? Does that look even? So that's a little bit of what I'm working on. Now, the, the reason why I'm making this gamp is so that I can try out all of these different twill variations. Um, this has all been done on four shaft, uh, uh, four shaft threading. And I'm gonna pick a pattern from here that I'm gonna use 
and to design a much larger baby blanket project. So this is all kind of like testing, it's a testing ground to see 32 different variations of twill. So that is something that's going to be coming up. And I will be uh, writing out the entire draft for this so that if you want to also make this, um, you can also make the exact same thing. I'm Glenda's asking what yarn this is. This is the Just Yarn Beam. It's a new yarn that they've just come out with. It's uh, three over two cotton, organic cotton made in the U.S. And um, it's probably equivalent to the size of 4.8 uh, eight or 8.4 eight cotton. Um, it's about that size, except it's three two cotton. And it works really beautifully. Uh, Karen is asking, do we have a class on sectional weaving? Um, we are working on a class for sectional weaving. I have ordered sectional equipment that is on its way here. <laughs> it's on its way. So that has been that. And then I wanted to share with you the next thing, which is the Crow Crag project that I have been working on. This has been on my baby wolf loom for a couple weeks now. And I am working on this, designing it as I go, picking colors as I go. Um, and yeah, it's neat. So each one of these sections is a combination of these little pill shapes, line shapes, dash shapes. I don't, I don't really know how to describe it, but there's five colors in each one of these sections. And so I'm just looking at the colors that I have and mixing and blending and rearranging colors so that I get like a nice pleasing um, collection of colors in each one of these segments. And then with each one of these, I'm also pulling three colors from the previous section so that there's continuity from section to section as the colors change. This is all just ideas that are in my mind um, and what I'm working on. But if you have not yet seen this book, I wanted to share this with you. This is um, this is Debbie Greenlaw's brand new book called Crokebrack Patterns. I don't have a copy of her first book in a physical format to show you. I bought it as a as a Kindle book because I was in a rush to read it. Um, but she this is her second book, and so um, Debbie is actually working on a Crokebrack class with us at this very moment, and so that hopefully will be out later on this summer. But in this book, this is a brand new book that just got released maybe like two weeks ago. Um, this is just full of patterns, full of patterns of ideas of things that you can do with your crookback weaving. Um, and so she has projects that are woven in here by many, many different um, weavers. And so if you are at all interested in this technique, I really, really encourage you to check it out. It's a massive massive book and it's I think it's going to be like a classic reference for anybody who's interested in doing crookback weaving so just quickly to share that with you and then I want to share with you the other thing that is uh on the on deck it's right now it's the waffle weave project that is going to be going on the mirror loom it's going to be that four shaft waffle weave um, and trying to use a counterbalance loom to weave this unbalanced weave structure. And so right now I've just got the warp all wound. It's going to be 8-2 cotton. Right now it's going to be a sampler. It's very, very small. So it's going to be 10 inches on the loom. And because waffle weave will theoretically uh, shrink up significantly, we're going to see how 10 inches of fabric, how it, how much of it shrinks. Um, so that's the idea there. And then working with obviously a bunch of different colors. Bye Glenda, it was nice to have you here. <laughs> um, yeah, so working with some solid color sections, working with some sections where there's going to be colored stripes, um, another section where there's just going to be crazy colors all blended together and you can see how that all works up in waffle weave. So that's another thing that's happening. And then finally the last thing is that I have been working on um, a lot of my spinning. I have been for a long time trying to be work working on the feel of my yarn. And so these are three yarns that I spun up. And then from the last month when we were talking about, I think it was Amanda who had spun some yarn and plied them together, two different colors together. And I was all inspired to ply my different colors together. So you can see I have a color on the right side here and a color on the left side here. And I mix the two together and combine them one ply of each to make that colored yarn. And so now I have three skeins of yarn, not entirely sure what I'm going to be doing with it. Um, but yeah, so you can see 
these are the yarns all together. Um, I am actually quite proud of this yarn just because of how um, how soft it is. This is like, I feel like this is the yarn where I got my spinning back, where I feel like my spinning actually feels much better. <laughs> it just feels better. Um, it's one thing to have yarn that looks nice. I think it's a whole other thing to have yarn that feels really nice. And so I, I'm quite proud of this yarn. Um, uh, I feel like I learned to spin this continuous back drafting technique from Rachel, uh, Rachel Smith, when she came to the studio. I'm watching her spin backwards and kind of uh, going backwards as she goes. Greta's asking what kind of a fiber this is. This is the BFL and silk. This color is called throwback. Um, and I cannot remember what the other color was called. <laughs> I should ask Charlotte. She will know. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm quite proud of this yarn. So I'm hoping to spin more of this kind of uh, drafting technique and see where it takes me because I feel like uh, if it can help me make better feeling yarn that's really really important to me right now um it also needs to be hard wearing it also needs to be able to go on the loom all of these kinds of things but i do want it to feel good and not just look nice thank you everybody and so now i want to share your projects so we've been seeing a lot of people in the uh, forums sharing their very first yarn, which is fantastic. So congratulations to you guys on spinning your first yarns. This is first hand spun yarn by Debbie, which is very lovely and consistent on her on her wheel there. And hand spun by Nicole, also beautiful and consistent. Like it's wonderful. I just, I really... I threw away my first yarn because it was so bad. So I'm just so excited to see all of your photos of your um, your yarns. So I can see here, um, this is looking lovely. We also have from Stephanie, she shared her photos of her first yarn that has been spun and plied. And if you follow Stephanie's um, Instagram, I think you should be able to find it through her, through the forums, but she's spinning beautiful, beautiful things on um, her spindle. And um, I thought it would be nice to share more, but there's just so many photos of so many beautiful things that you guys are making. So um, I just suggest that you guys go to the forums and check out these projects. So I've put the links to all of these here so that you can go find them. Um, she's also spinning the uh, worksheet that was designed by Katrina for Katrina's class called Spinning Up a Level. And so this is that worksheet where you work through and you spin your default yarn, you spin a short forward draft, short backward, spinning from the fold, spinning from the fold, all different ways, and then keeping track of uh, what you're spinning. Yeah, so that way, again, it's about developing that flexibility, the versatility, being able to change your hands, being able to modify your technique all the time so that you can make all different kinds of yarn for different purposes. So I encourage everybody to do this exercise. This is a great one to practice your spinning. Also at the other end, I wanted to share with you guys some projects that are just simply bonkers, amazing in the forum right now. There's this epic um, thread that Amanda started at the beginning of the um, make along. And so basically Amanda has spun yarn, two different kinds of yarn with different fibers. One of them is Merino, I believe, and the other one is Merino and silk. So you can see this shiny uh, ply here and they've been plied together. And she's made hand spun yarn out of this. And now she is knitting the even tied sweater. This is designed by Holly Yo. It came out of our Tempest collection probably about six years ago. Um, but it is a beautiful pattern. And it the original pattern uses two different uh, weights of yarn. One is a fingering weight yarn and the other one is a mo uh, mohair lace yarn. And so Amanda has created those two yarns through her own spinning and she's knitting it up right now. You have to go see this particular epic post because there are so many more photos. There's so much more conversation about the progress and it is just phenomenal. Like she's finished, um, I think two pieces now front and back and it's beautiful. So I encourage you guys to check out her project diary and follow along with what she's making there. Um, another epic, epic, hand spun sweater project is here. This one is by Vicky. Vicky, our moderator, you can also find a lot of her progress. She posts a lot on her Instagram with the projects that she's made. But this one, um, this particular um, post is 
fantastic. And it talks about how she uh, dyed this fiber and then how she managed to spin all the fiber. Um, she's created this gradient with her hand spun and then she cast on a love note sweater designed by Tin Can Knits. Um, I don't think she did any of the lace up here, but I think it's using the base formula for the silhouette of the sweater. Um, and seven days later, <laughs> seven days later, she had a sweater, her first hand spun sweater. Um, so she has posted many, many more pictures of this project and they look phenomenal. So I encourage you guys to go check this out. Now, the reason why this URL looks so uh, weird is because those are actually emojis. So if you type that in, they actually become emojis <laughs> in the URL. So that's how you get to that thread. But congratulations to you guys on making your hand spun sweaters. They look incredible. We also wanted to share some dyeing progress. So this is Susan S has shared a couple of photos that she's been dyeing. Um, and so she's the, the, the name of the thread is, I think I've got the hang of this. And so um, these are acid dyed skeins. So that is looking fantastic. Thanks for sharing that, Susan. And then this is very, very clever. So this is Anne. Um, you can see here it is in the thread that is under Arashi Shibori wrapping. So like we talked about Mariana's class earlier, Mariana teaches different Shibori techniques. And one of them is this style called Arashi Shibori, which is where you take a cloth and you fold it and then you wrap it around a tube or like a pipe. And then you put some twine around the whole thing and then scrunch it up. And so the part that is um, touching the twine that's packed close to the pipe is not going to get exposed to dye, but the stuff that's on the outside, the cloth that's on the very outside, you can see right here on the outside of the pipe, the exposed part will get dye. So then when you finally take apart this entire contraption, you unravel the whole thing, unfold the whole thing, and you'll get this kind of patterning in your dyed fabric. And so Anne says this is very clever because this, PVC tube that is holding her fabric has been connected to her husband's lathe. So her husband set up um, a system where they could put the tube on the lathe and then holding the string, then, you know, let the lathe turn. And so it produces this, um, this, this, th it basically allows her to wind the string around the cloth in a much easier, much faster way than we did when we actually did the filming where you have to like wrap around manually. So this was fantastic. Um, and she's dying more of these. She's making more of these. So you can follow this thread to see all the things that Anne is doing with her shibori. And this is like the final, uh, final project I wanted to show you guys. Catherine S in the forums posts beautiful, like unbelievably beautiful photos of her work. Um, so, so many beautiful projects. There was just one like last night <laughs> in the forums that was beautiful. And I was like, I don't, I don't have a chance to put it into the, into the keynote presentation here, but um, I wanted to share with you some of the things that she's been working on. So um, we made these optical uh, mixed radiant towels. They're called, yeah, radiant towels from one of the hand woven color episodes. So basically the idea that when you use a different weft color against your warp, all of those colors will mix and blend to produce new colors. And so she was put on this warp uh, that seems very similar to the warp that we did in that class. And then she used a different color for each of the wefts and she did them in rainbow color order. So rainbow color of wefts um, produces a rainbow color uh, set of radiant towels. It's just fantastic. Fantastic. It's beautiful and I just love how she's arranged this photo. It's, you can see this beautiful color wheel. You can see the effect that all of this uh, weft color has had on the warp. It's just beautiful. So beautiful. Um, let's see, Francesca's asking, um, are you considering a class where we beginners can have a spindle spinning class with wool from different sheep breeds as the one by the wool? We do actually have spindle spinning classes. Diana Twist teaches a class called spinning with suspended spindles and um, that class is available and um, you can do that and also spin different sheep breeds at the same time yes yeah, so thank you oops thank you so much oops oh here we go thank you so much 
Thank you so much to Kathleen for sharing those for sorry. Thank you so much to Catherine for sharing those with us. And now I wanted to share this one. Let me see if I can get this to work again. Is it working? Yes. Okay. So this is the sheep breed sampler set. So these are some um, of the fibers that are going into the kits that I showed you guys earlier. You can see here that's in the tube. And we have four of these different kinds of kits. And um, so what I wanted to do was we're going to do a little bit of a giveaway. So there is a link here. It should be live. It should be working right now. Um, but if you put this link in, you should be able to go and enter your information and you will be entered in the prize draw for your choice of one of these sheep breed spinning sets. So you can choose either the long wool one or you can choose the down wool one, whichever one you feel like you would most like to experience um, that is available and there for you as well. And so that giveaway is going to be only available to the people who are watching the live stream. So we'll leave it open until midnight tonight. Um, yeah. And then we'll contact you and find out how we can ship this to you. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you guys so much for being here. Um, just to answer some of your questions. Yeah. Like what Francesca was saying, um, all of the stuff that you can learn in the sheep breeds class can be done on any spinning tool that you want. So you can learn about all the different sheep breeds and spin all the different kinds of fiber. You can do that with a supported spindle if you want. You can do it with an e-spinner if you want. You can do it with a spindle if you want. So I feel like the fiber is one world of things and then the tools is like a whole other world of things. And so you can learn to spin and use your spinning technique on all of these different kinds of tools and then also work with all different kinds of fiber and then see how those fibers can be applied to the different kinds of tools. So yeah, that's one of the questions. I think someone else had a question near the beginning about um, if there was a way that we could make longer videos for our classes so that we could have them as one continuous video. And so that is something that we are definitely working on. Um, I know that people like to set their videos and then just have them play um, and then be able to work on their projects as they're working. So rather than having to click through to the next lesson to the next lesson, we're trying to combine a lot of things to make them much longer projects. So that is that. Um, wondering if anybody else has any questions. Yes. So someone uh, warped a work in progress was asking about if we were doing cochineal in the class and there is cochineal in the dyeing class that we are doing. So that is going to be covered as well. Um, let's see. If you guys have any other questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat and I'm just running through the chat right now to make sure that I didn't miss anything. Fantastic. I do want to encourage you guys, if you are all access members and you do have questions that you would like to answer um, on the live office hours, you can go to the um, schoolofsweetgeorgia.com slash submit a question and it has hyphens between it, submit a question. And there's a form there and it goes directly to me and then I get all of your information and um, it's also uh, a, a way that if you would like to submit projects to me to show in the show and tell section of this live office hours, you can submit questions and submit projects and submit photos and things. And I can absolutely share them on the live office hours as well here. Fantastic. It's so nice to see everybody's name. Um, oh, here. Marjorie is asking for the link. Here is the link. That is the link for the giveaway. Sorry about that. So schoolofsweetgeorgia.com slash live 2021 April, and that should get you the link to the giveaway. Thank you guys for being here. And uh, if you have any more questions, please feel free to message me in the, uh, in the forums um, and uh, we can get back to you there for sure. Thank you all so much for being here today. I will see you guys next month. All right. Bye for now. And be sure to join that natural dying study group if you want to participate with us. Thanks guys. See you later.